about quantum, quantum thermodynamics. And um, given that, and that's certainly, it's certainly a pleasure and a privilege, but uh, given that I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the term quantum thermodynamics is correct, or, or that I agree with that, with that formulation, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather talk about, about um, say, a slightly rephrased <laughs> uh, title, no? So non-equilibrium thermodynamics of quantum, of quantum processes. Because I believe this is more faithful um, to what we are actually, actually uh, meaning when we, when we discuss of, uh, quantum thermodynamics. Of course, it's a shortcut in, in notation, so to say, but, and, and it's fine to use it. Um, and this is, so this series of three, of three lectures um, should, be, should be understood as um, an open invitation to, uh, to get your hands dirty in this field with these problems, with the set of, of issues that we are going to uh, go through together, and start wondering about what are the uh, thermodynamic implications of quantum, of quantum dynamics. OK, so um, just to give you not the time to get used to my, to my, to my stupid accent, um, let me spend a couple of words about uh, the place I come from, or at least the place where I work which also provides some uh, motivation, so to say, for being interested in questions of a thermodynamic nature. OK, so um, I work here in Belfast. Belfast is, I don't know if it can be seen from, from that. So first of all, I didn't check. Can you hear me OK at the back? OK, I usually shout. I'm not necessarily, uh, I don't know if, if, if I need that microphone. But anyway, so Belfast is there, is this red spot. I hope it's visible uh, to everyone. And um, so the green, the green spot all around, the red one, is what is called Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is, um, geographically speaking, Ireland. Politically speaking, is UK. Uh, but it depends uh, who you are talking to, right? And, um, and then, uh, say, despite what the present climate, say, political climate claims, UK is in Europe. This is a statement, and there it stays, OK? So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's where it is, and that's where it remains. Now, um, in Belfast, uh, so my university is Queen's. So the university where I work at is, is Queen's University. So this is the building. And Queen's was the, the house of a few of um, quite, quite well-known well physicists. Some of them uh, you might have heard of. Um, some of them probably are new. Uh, Larmor of the Larmor frequency, I'm sure you have heard of him, um, was, was a professor there for a bit of time. Um, then there are these two guys, which I'm not entirely sure are uh, um, so well known, at least not to these um, audience, Harry Massey and uh, David Bates. They were very well known computational atomic physicists. And uh, in particular, David Bates single-handedly basically founded the, the department that I'm working, on, I'm working at now. And then finally, I mean, uh, yeah, this is a very, very old picture that puts together both Massey and Bates. Uh, Bates is here, and Massey is somewhere. I cannot really, ah, yes, it's a young Massey here. Um, and then there is the final, probably the most, the most well-known, um, or one of the most well-known uh, persons coming from, from Belfast and, and linked to Queens, which is John Bell. So Bell was a, was a student at Queens. He never actually worked in Queens, um, at least for, a, OK, unless for a, for, a, for a very brief stint as a lab technician. Then he was, um, say, the, his line manager, as they would say right now, uh, his supervisor, recognized that his potential, so and he recommended him for a, for a PhD, and then he moved, he moved on. But Bell is, is, um, is from Belfast, actually, from a few, from a few um, hundred meters from the university. That's where he is, is birth houses. Uh, this is an um, say uncommon good day in Belfast. So this is the campus of the university. And at the campus, um, you find this, this thing, no, a blue plaque uh, named after Bell um, and put there by the, by the UK Institute of Physics. And if you have, um, if you have uh, nothing better to do on the 4th of November of uh, each year, then we celebrate Bell on the 4th of November. So that's, that's institutionally the uh, John Bell Day, 
Why the 4th of November? Because that was the day when he submitted his big paper. Um, and, um, and the Royal Irish Academy, in collaboration, which is basically the, the equivalent of the um, Royal Society in Ireland, uh, the Royal Irish Academy, um, in, in, in collaboration with Queen's, um, celebrates every year John Bell. So if you fancy a little bit of, of uh, physics discussions, some good beer and bad weather, just come along on the 4th of November to celebrate the big man himself. Yet he's not the biggest, or at least not the only big figure that we have from that place. Uh, Lord Kelvin. Lord Kelvin was from Belfast. So um, I think his family moved to Scotland in 1804, no, later on. So he was born in Belfast in 1824, and he moved in in, to, to Scotland when he was eight years old. So in, around um, 1830, 1832. And if you come and see Belfast, oh, so for the, for the John Bell Day, then you can enjoy a kneel in front of the statue that is at Bot in Botanic Garden um, at the back of the university. So basically the university is here, and this is the statue named um, after, after Kelvin. And somehow the geographical proximity of Kelvin to the office, no, I mean, it's a few, a few hundred meters from my office, um, and the fact that Bell was, was, born, was born in Belfast, put these two things together, and then you start, um, you start understanding why my group is so interested in um, working at the interface between quantum and thermodynamics. Okay, so, so to say, uh, it's all... It's all, it's all um, um, say, the fault of these two persons uh, that, you have to, that you have to suffer my bad English and um, unfit slides. So I have a, a lot to live up to. No? Um, Martin gave a fantastic lecture on the, white, on the, on, on the blackboard. Uh, I'm going to use uh, heavily my slides, but at some point we are going to stop and um, go through a few calculations uh, together on the on the blackboard, hopefully without any mistake from my side. Now, why, why thermodynamics? And why should we be interested in exploring which are the implications that thermodynamics has for quantum dynamics? Or vice versa, how quantum, quantum mechanics can um, influence the development of a, of a thermodynamic, of a thermodynamic um, framework for microscopic processes? Well. Um, Motivations are various, no? and uh, somehow uh, variegate. Historically, thermodynamics was born um, because, because of the Napoleonic Wars. No? So um, Carnot wanted to understand why um, the uh, army, the French army, um, got defeated. And um, he thought, or he could pinpoint, um, in the inefficiency of the, of the French weapons, a reason for, uh, or at least one of the reasons, for uh, the Napoleonic army to be, uh, to, be, to, be, to be defeated. So if you want, thermodynamic historically has a very handsome sort of uh, origin or motivations. These guys wanted to build better, better weapons and realized that what they knew about the steam engine um, could have helped. And then they developed a framework that was so, um, so important for the development of the Industrial Revolution. So um, very technology-oriented motivations for the development of a fundamental framework uh, that has been then used until now um, in many, many different, many different contexts. And that has evolved, has evolved in time um, in a, in a quite, quite ample way quite an ample breadth of, of ways. So in, rather than focusing on uh, the various facets that uh, the evolution of thermodynamics has, has undergone so far, um, in these three lectures, starting from, from, from today, we are going to go through the framework for uh, non-equilibrium quantum processes. So the framework for non-equilibrium thermodynamics at the quantum, at the quantum level. Why? Because when you, when you deal with a microscopic system, no? so these days we are, uh, so the hype <laughs> linked to quantum technologies is growing. I mean, the interest in that is, um, is growing as well. Um, when you are interested in the development of a framework for quantum technology, you are interested in kicking your systems 
considerably out of equilibrium. You want to process information. By doing that, you want to subject your, your register, your computational register, um, to transformation that change, manipulate the state, huh? the quantum mechanical state. So to say, um, you are really interested in genuine non-equilibrium non -equilibrium processes. And um, therefore, uh, this is the natural somehow scenario to consider when trying and build up an interface between thermodynamics and quantum, and quantum dynamics. Uh, the second motivation, or at least the second, the second direction along, one, along which one can go, is more fundamental and is linked to um, the following question. Say, are the concepts of um, work, heat, uh, entropy that we that we use in macroscopic standard thermodynamics, if you want. No, the one that you are used to uh, when you open, or the one that you have seen by opening the book, when opening the book by, I don't know, Kallen, or the book by, by Zemansky, I studied on Zemansky. No, my, my thermodynamics course was, was based on that book. Now, you open that and you have definitions of what work heat entropy is from a macroscopic um, thermodynamic sense. Are these concepts still valid, or do we need to reformulate them when we are interested in um, genuinely quantum mechanical processes, when the uh, objects, the, the, the media upon which we perform the transformations that we are used to implement in a thermodynamic sense are, are implemented on microscopic systems? And even, say, digging even more, um, say, into the foundations, um, Martin has introduced uh, the concept of quantum resource and resource theory, and we'll go into that probably. Um, um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if this is the case, but I, I think you are going into resource theory for coherences towards the end of your, of your, hopefully, of your lecture. So um, can, we, can we study, can we use what we know of resource theory, um, what we know about quantum coherences, quantum correlations, uh, to understand and to uh, expand the domain of, of, of thermodynamics and make, make use of them to uh, design better, better devices, thermodynamically inspired devices for the processing of information. These are the somehow, not the two, the, 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 three, the three directions along which you might want to go when you, when you address thermodynamics of quantum, of quantum processes. To me, what is, so say, as any lectures, uh, right, this is a highly subjective presentation of a field, right? So just take it as, as my own perspective. Well, uh, the study of thermodynamics um, and the interplay with quantum, with quantum processes is interesting for two reasons. On one hand, it provides a very, very natural um, framework for uh, the assessment of what we call the quantum to classical transition, okay? So, the process according to which, or due to which, um, any quantum system loses its quantumness, its quantum nature, and get uh, basically um, more, much more mundane, becomes um, describable through, through the laws of classical, classical physics. Now, this diagram here uh, should be taken as highly qualitative, so um, that's why I don't have I don't have anything very, very clearly specified along the axes, but, uh, the axis, but what, I, um, what I want to illustrate with that is um, the common belief that if you look at the um, quantumness in a given system, and, and, and I'm foggy, I'm very fuzzy about that, so I'm not defining what, what I mean by quantumness. Take it as your, your uh, preferred indicator of deviation from, from classical dynamics. For instance, the amount of quantum correlations that you have in a, given, in a given register. And on the horizontal axis, I have an equally undefined or not very well-defined concept of complexity, which you can take as the size of your, of your device or the number of elements that uh, pertain to it, no? the number of particles that you have, to, you, you, you have in, in, your, in your box, um, or the mass of the systems that you have, right? Then what is commonly believed is that um, if you increase the degree of complexity of your system, then uh, seeding quantumness in that, or maintaining the quantum features of such a system, becomes a much more difficult task. I mean, 
we might agree or not about that. I mean, I think it's a highly, uh, say, um, case-dependent case dependent problem. Um, but, uh, say, without any, any request for uh, a canonical nature of this plot, just take it as it is, okay? So, thermodynamic is an inherent lame many body, many body theory. I'm going to contradict this statement uh, in a minute by addressing the dynamics of a single, from the thermodynamic viewpoint, of a, of a single particle. Uh, but, uh, so if you think of thermodynamics, what you have in mind is a gas, right, or, or, or a piece of material across which you want to, to uh, let some heat go, right? So macroscopic systems, complex systems, um, in, a very loose, in a very loose sense. So it's a perfect scenario uh, to, to, to uh, say adopt if you're interested in precisely this point and how, in characterizing how quantum features are lost. Um, due to the growing complexity of your, of your device. And um, more technologically um, oriented, well, uh, just like I said, no, at the beginning, thermodynamics was, was, was somehow originated to improve the working principles of weapons and then machines. No? So one can, can take inspiration from that and um, dream of building um, thermodynamic machines, cycles, engines, that might make use of elements of quantumness to boost their performance. Now, whether or not this is the case, we still don't know. Um, there are steps towards that that are currently, currently being taken. Um, so this is just to give you an idea that both at the foundational view, say level, the fundamental level, and more technology-oriented level, um, there are open questions when you address the, um, the interplay between quantum and thermodynamics. And that probably makes the study of this field um, worthwhile. Now, a long introduction um, to something that is structured as follows. So this is a, a rough schedule of uh, the discussion that we are going through in these three lectures. So I will start with the um, redefinition or uh, the introduction of concepts like, like work. And in the second lecture, we'll go, we'll go to heat when you deal with an explicit non-equilibrium framework for thermodynamics, and when your, your um, process, the transformation that you are dealing with, is inherently quantum. Um, the, second, the second lecture, so roughly speaking tomorrow, <laughs> if I stop talking too much about motivations and so on, we'll deal with Landauer principle. And our, um, our Landauer principle can be intertwined with um, quantum open system dynamics. Thirdly, um, and this is where the crux of the discussion is, now we are going to talk about irreversibility and entropy production. Uh, and they state here in closed quantum system, but we are going to have a, uh, say, to visit also the open, the open, the open, the open dynamics, uh, the open system dynamics framework. And if I have enough time, um, I'll go to a, a very brief discussion of, um, say, the uh, interplay between the theory of quantum correlations uh, the framework for, for the characterization of quantum coherences uh, that maybe Martin will talk about, and thermodynamics, okay? So this is r a rough schedule, so don't take it um, a as a contract, right? So I'm, not, uh, I'm very much likely not going to stick to this, to this um, detailed plan. Um, I'll be happy if we address irreversibility at some point in this discussion, okay? So, um, Without further ado, we start with the um, introduction of the non-equilibrium thermodynamic framework um, at, the quantum, at the quantum level. And the objective here, the goal, is to go to what are called fluctuation, fluctuation theorems. Now, before we start in, uh, say, getting, getting um, not warming up and discussing uh, really the technical aspect of the framework, is there any question at this, at this point? Anything unclear? Anything you want to ask? Okay, great. Um, feel free to stop me anytime. Um, let's see how it goes. So, um, I recommend you to have a look at this paper. Okay, if you if you want to somehow to um, to get a, a flavor of um, the possible discrepancies, the differences between. Um, quantum 
formulations of non-equilibrium thermodynamics and classical ones, well, this, this paper provides a very nice, a very nice introduction. And uh, the title, although I have taken, say, the abstract and the title are taken from the archive version of the paper, I think it's faithful to the published version of the paper itself, which is in PRE uh, 10 years ago now. So uh, the title um, illustrates exactly, I mean, in a, in a sentence, uh, what the crux of the, of, of, of the, what the message is, no? Fluctuation theorems, work is not unobservable. Full stop, right? So this is a, some form of, of death sentence, right? So um, don't even think about the possibility of going into the lab and devise an experiment that directly provides you, directly provides you the amount of work that you can perform on a given system as, um, say, for instance, the eigenvalue of a given observable, right? That's not the case. According to this paper, you have to be um, a little bit more inventive and devise smarter ways of assessing how much work you are doing um, on a system or how much work a system is doing when you address uh, work, thermodynamic work, from a, from a quantum, quantum mechanical viewpoint. It appears somewhere in the, uh, to, so, so in the, in the in, already in the first column of the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Already in the first, in the first. Part. It's also, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, the fact that you are, um, you have observable there somehow suggests the framework that you are that you are addressing. Okay, so let's see what these guys had in mind um, when um, when stating when stating this. Okay, so how? Am I going to uh, quantify the amount of work that you are performing on a system that evolves unitarily? Okay, so this is the framework so for, for, for now, and it will be it will be that until the end the end of this discussion, and probably for a little bit of tomorrow's discussion. Okay, tomorrow's lecture. So I have a quantum mechanic. I have a, a system. I um, implement a transformation on it that lets, let it evolve, uh, lets it evolve unitarily. And then you might wonder, OK, I'm changing the energy of this system. How much work am I doing on it? Or how much work can I extract from, from, from the system itself? And um, these, um, this paper provides you with an operational way of actually going into it and providing an answer to that. So um, let's start with a familiar, familiar scenario. You have your, say, your favorite quantum system, characterized by its Hamiltonian HI. And a lot earlier than the start of your, of your experiment, you have put it in contact with a bath at a given temperature. And you waited long enough for the system to thermalize with the bath itself. Okay? Such a way, so this T smaller than 0 means that I have done it as a preparation stage, so before the actual experiment starts. So at t equal to 0, when, that is when, when the uh, experiment starts, what you do is that you detach your system from the bath. So now your system is in a thermal state at the temperature of the bath. It was at equilibrium with the bath. So I've detached it from that, um, assuming that the detaching process didn't alter the equilibrium, say, the state of the system itself. And what I do is that I perform a measurement on it. Okay? So what I do is that I ask myself, OK, um, what is the chance, what is the probability that um, I find the system at this instant of time in the nth energy eigenstate of this Hamiltonian HI? Okay? So I have a well-defined energy. I'm asking, oh, I have a very well-defined Hamiltonian. And I'm asking, what is the probability that my system is in the nth energy eigenstate of this Hamiltonian um, immediately after I detached it from the contact with the environment? Okay. And um, this probability, I'm going to call it P and naught. And the naught here, so the zero here, is because this is the instant of time t equal to zero. And then there is because I'm asking how much is the probability of finding the particle in the nth, or the system, in the nth energy eigenstate. Now it's the, so, so far very, somehow very passive, right? Or you observe it only. 
we now dig into the active bit of the protocol. Okay, so I'm now taking a wrench, I'm changing something in the, in the system. So what I'm doing is that I'm changing the Hamiltonian of the system itself. So I have a parameter, in principle a time-dependent parameter, that I decide to change in time. And I do it, given that my system is a completely now isolated from its environment, right? So uh, besides the bath, there is no external world, so the system is completely isolated. And from this point on, so from step B4 onward, there will be, there will be no environment whatsoever. So the dynamics that is uh, induced by my modification of the parameter characterizing the energy of the system induces a unitary evolution. Fair enough? So my system is evolving in time according to this time evolution operator u. For a time tau that I decide arbitrarily. At the instant of time tau, I have the end of my protocol, okay? I have the end of my, of my experiment, which I conclude in the, following, in the following manner. So as I said, I've changed the Hamiltonian of my system from HI to HF. So HF is the final Hamiltonian. And now I do again what I did at t equal to zero. That is, I measure, no? I project onto one of the energy eigenstates of the final Hamiltonian, so of HF, and I wonder how much is the probability, and this is a conditional probability, how much is the probability Pm known n, so this is the conditional probability, to find the system at time t equal to tau in the nth energy eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian, given that at t equal to zero, the system was found in the nth energy eigenstate of the initial Hamiltonian. Does it make sense, guys? I mean, it's more difficult to explain than to write down and, 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 and no? It's, it's easier to, to understand what that is in symbol than, than to explain it. Are we okay with that? I measured it in nth energy eigenstate of the initial Hamiltonian. The guy evolved. Then I measure, the so I measure again energy in the end. This time I have a different set of eigenstates because my Hamiltonian has changed. And this is the conditional probability no? that, I, that I can get. Fair enough? Now, question. Suppose that I repeat this very same experiment a zillion of, a zillion of times. And for now, let's concentrate on the first step, so on part B only. So I do it many, many times, right? Will I get always the same eigenvalue if I measure no, the energy at t equal to zero? Obviously no, because my initial, initial state, the state of my, the initial state of my system was a thermal state, right? So these uh, probabilities will follow uh, no, a, a Boltzmann distribution, right? I have a thermal state, that's, that's what I get. So every time I repeat the experiment, I get a different outcome of energy, and the probability to get the nth energy eigenstate will follow Boltzmann distribution. So uh, I have an element of thermal randomness in this experiment that is of an entirely classical nature. No quantum mechanics is, is, is concerned at this point or is involved at this point. Then again, no, I have my zillion, zillion copies of the same, same experiment. I'm repeating my experiment many, many times. And they perform my second measurement. By the way, this protocol is usually called the two-measurement protocol, and you understand why, right? So you're doing two measurements, right? So will I get the same? No? Will I get the same energy eigenstate? No, will I find the system all the time in the same energy eigenstates at the end of the protocol? No, because my system has evolved quantum mechanically, and we know that if I perform a measurement, right, Right? In quantum mechanics, the outcome is only probabilistic. So I have a second element of randomness in this process, which is somehow enforced by quantum mechanics. So if you repeat your experiment the zillion times that I mentioned, what you end up with is a distribution of values. It's not a single-valued experiment. No? You have a distribution of values. You have many values of Pm known n. You have many values of Pn naught. So what do you do with this distribution, right? You build 
the work probability distribution. So you immediately find out that according to this framework, work becomes a stochastic variable, right? How much is the work that you're doing in this, in this uh, not following this process? Well, the system was is isolated. I've changed its energy. So this change in energy must all go into work. What is the change in energy? Well, it will be the difference between the energy of the, no, of the final eigenstate that I'm finding the system into minus the energy of the initial eigenstate that I, I found the system into when, I performing the when performing the first measurement. Does it make sense? Yeah? Please. Okay, very good question. Uh, if I heard it properly, I mean, it's fine. There, 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 is a, there is a bit of noise down here. No, no, I, I, I think I have heard it. So the question is, um, how, about, no, how about the cost of actually not changing, right? Changing, not wrenching my system, not changing it. Yeah, we are going to uh, ignore that cost for, <laughs> for, the old, for the old discussion. You're absolutely right. I should, I should account for all possible sources of work done on the system or possible wells for the work that I'm doing, right, on the system itself. Um, the framework that I'm going to use at this stage is, and set by, the, by, by that paper, uh, such that basically all the thermodynamic costs or all the thermodynamics relevant change in energy, energetics are all in this energy difference. In principle, I should reformulate in a way to put in the actual agent that um, that changed the Hamiltonian itself. I, I might go, go farther and, um, and say, yeah, I mean, I'm performing two measurements here. Is this cost-free? So if I perform a measurement thermodynamically, uh, what does, how much does, does it cost? This is a perfectly legitimate question uh, that has been addressed. So um, there are papers um, working out or trying to work out the uh, cost of general measurements both projective and, and uh, generalized. And uh, it's, a much more, it's a much more involved um, uh, framework that I want to stay away from for now. OK, I, I understand it's not a very satisfactory answer, but um, say, let's go step by step, if you, if you allow me. Any other question? So the, the measurements are costless. costless. At this stage, costless, <laughs> OK, so as I said, we have this bunch of numbers. What are we going to do with them? Well, I, I want to organize them in a, in a distribution, in a probability distribution, made out of delta peaks. These delta peaks are centered precisely at the amount of work that I'm doing no, by changing the energy of the system. Okay? So by changing the energy of the system from EN to EM dash, these are the two outcomes of my two measurements. How tall is each peak, right? Each, the, each delta peak that I have in this distribution, well, the, the height of each peak is given by, by this product, right? By the probability to find the part, the system in the nth energy eigenstate at t equal to zero, and the conditional probability pm known n at time tau. W is the work that I'm doing. And this is simply uh, the, the, the difference between. No, 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 no average. No, no, no. It's simply uh, defined as the, uh, so if you want, the point like difference between EM dash and EN. So is, there is no other, say, we are excluding all other possible costs. And we are excluding um, any environment. So the energy, the change in energy of my system, all goes into the work that you are doing on the system or that the system does. So it's a kind of sort of. Mm, so, uh, there's a construct of a better model. Correct. I don't think you can build a, 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 perpetual, a perpetual motion machine from that. Um, but, uh, 
No, no, no. The, of course. Of course. Say, uh, erasure should be there. Erasure should be there. So the reset, a reset step has to, be, has, to be, has to be included. And that costs, of course. That costs. I'm not resetting at this point. <laughs> there is a. Yeah, so the question, the question was uh, whether I can, um, if any measurements, so if all measurements in this setting are cost free, um, can I build a basically a perpetual motion like device uh, through that? And um, the answer is that uh, I think you, you escape from it. By, by putting in your framework the necessity of resetting your machine. At this stage, we are not, we are not focusing on, 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 on that. Okay. So the cost of resetting will be, will be, in, uh, will be introduced tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, no. This is a single, a single transformation. And, um, and if you want, even if you want to reset, reuse the machine after, no, after, after the first transformation, um, then uh, that is you start a new and you, 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 um, you proceed from there. Say so at, the, at the start of my assumption is that the initial state of the system is, is a thermal state. So I have to re-initialize my system into, into such a thermal state. OK. Um, so we now have a probability distribution. We are now sort of. Uh, Agreeing on the fact that this work that work becomes a stochastic variable and is distributed according to this probability distribution. Now there is a label here f, uh, which is going to be uh, so the presence of this word of this label will be clarified in a bit, but this basically stands for forward. So this is the process uh, according to which I'm changing the Hamiltonian of the system from Hi to Hf. Okay? At some point, uh, possibly tomorrow, given the time, 12.30, right? I have to stop at 12.30, 12, am I right? Thirty-five. Okay, so 10 minutes. Forty-five. Oh, wow. Okay, so we have time. <laughs> so uh, at some point, we are going to introduce a label B, which will stand for backward process, and that will be the process that takes the Hamiltonian of the system from HF to HI. Okay, so it's the time reversed. It's the time reversed process. Now, um, I'm a quantum optician by training, so you give me a probability. So fully, Hamiltonian. fully Hamiltonian process. It's completely reversed. Completely reversed. But again, so you can understand what I'm, what I'm going to clarify. But say, take two different sets of experiments. One where I initially give you HI and you are asked to change it into HF. And one where I initially give you HF, a completely set, different set of processes, and, um, and you change it all the way down to HI, OK? Oh, mind you guys, I've not been uh, prescriptive about how you are changing the, initial, the Hamiltonian of the system, OK? So I didn't say anything about, say, first of all, uh, how, how quickly you are changing this this Hamiltonian, right? So it might be extremely slow in time, right? So you can be very close to um, the paradigm of um, quasi-static processes, which is what you read in a uh, standard thermodynamics book. No? You have to be quasi-static to be able to define at every instant of time thermodynamically meaningful quantities, heat, work. Or you can be very quick. No, you can. You are impatient, like I'm usually. So you change the energy very quickly. No, non quasi statically. I, I, I didn't put any constraint on that. So you're free to change. Or actually, Fabrizio was, is able to, or, or is free to choose any any way of um, <clears throat> implementing such transformation. These, of course, has consequences. But we are going to see that for things like fluctuation theorem theorems, it's actually highly in material, so to say, the way you, process, you, 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 you implement the transformation itself. Now, what I was saying is that if you give me a probability distribution, um, given my, my background, I'm naturally uh, inclined to take the Fourier transform of it and look at what is called the characteristic function of it. Okay, so uh, allow me to introduce the characteristic function for work distribution, which is what I'm going to call chi from now on. 
U is the conjugate variable for, for work there. Um, and this is defined as the Fourier transform, the complex Fourier transform of my probability distribution for work. Now, why am I making it uh, more complicated than, than what it was already? Why am I introducing this, this characteristic function? Because sometimes, sometimes it's easier to work with the characteristic function than with the probability distribution itself. So uh, there are problems that are more easily addressed by means of the characteristic function than the probability distribution, and vice versa. Okay, so uh, it, it's, it's again a very problem dependent, um, case dependent problem, okay? But now, uh, and this is when I want, to, I want to do the first calculation of, of this set of lectures. Um, let's try and work out together this nice expression here, which is the um, general form that the characteristic function for work distribution takes when you implement precisely the protocol that I have explained so far. Just to remind you, U is my time evolution operator. U dagger is obviously no, the, the Hermitian conjugate of it. Um, lambda is the parameter that I'm changing in time. So it's the guy that defines basically the process itself. Lambda goes from lambda naught to lambda tau. And uh, if you take H of lambda naught, that is my, I had some chalk here, so h of lambda naught, you can assume, is your hi, and h of lambda tau, on the other hand, is your final Hamiltonian hf. Uh, is my, my handwriting is historically bad. Uh, people complain every time. Is it okay? Can you, yeah? Whenever you don't understand what I'm writing, you, it's my fault, and you tell me. Okay, so just to warn you, this is my x. Right? So when you don't understand what I write, that's very much likely an x. Yeah? So, uh, <laughs> what is a rho g here? Rho g of lambda naught is my initial thermal state. So this is the initial state of my system, which you can write like that in terms of the initial Hamiltonian of, um, of, the, of the system itself. And lambda and z, that will, use, will be used to um, label the partition function. So the trace of this quantity of e to minus beta h of lambda naught. Uh, the last parameter that I need to de define is beta. Beta is one over kt, so it's the inverse temperature of, of, uh, of the bath. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm throwing this expression on this slide. Let's see how we get it, yeah? Let's see how we get it, uh, starting from the actual definition of the work probability distribution that I've, um, I've given you here, okay? So, um, again, so you, you will have to suffer my handwriting. Let's see, let's see how it goes. <coughs> First of all, so uh, let's write down what the probability distribution for the forward process is. So as I said, it's a sum over n and m, right? The two labels for initial and final eigenstate or initial and final uh, energy eigenvalues of my measurement. Of, uh, P of m known n at time tau times Pn at time zero times my delta peak centered at the difference between the final energy Em dash and the initial energy, En. Okay, makes sense? Okay, now, um, what is this guy, right? Um, we define the initial Hamiltonian Hi as having eigenstates and eigenvalues, En and then. okay? And I'm going to say that Hf, the final Hamiltonian, as energy eigenvalues em dash and energy eigenstates m. Okay? Right, so uh, what is p and naught in this notation? p and naught is e to minus beta en over z, right? z of lambda naught. So I'm going to set as notation no? z of lambda naught, so the partition function. Um, associated with the initial, the initial state of my system, 
uh, Z0. And I'm going to call the partition function associated with lambda tau at Z tau. So P and not easy peasy, that's, that's what we have. No Gauss, say, probably Boltzmann distributed. No, um, okay, uh, let's call them EM dash. Uh, these are two different sets of eigenstates. If you, if you have commuting Hamiltonians, it becomes very, very boring. You can do it, of course, but it, it becomes extremely boring. Um, I'm assuming that these two sets now are different sets of, of, of eigenstates, okay? So the two Hamiltonians don't commute. Okay, what is PM known n at time tau? Well, um, no, uh, let's follow the prescription. This is the probability to find the system in M given that it was in N at time t equal to zero. So I found the system in N. I've implemented my process, my transformation. So I've implemented my time evolution operator U until time tau. And then at that time, I've performed my measurement, my second measurement, getting my state m dash. So let's call these guys m dash, dash, dash. Well, there is already a dash there, so I don't need to, to dash anything else, okay? And this, is, this must be square modulus to get my probability, okay? So I'm now going to put these two guys into my probability distribution for work. And I'm also using the definition for uh, the, characteristic, the characteristic function for work distribution. Are you okay if I um, delete these two guys? Is, is it clear what HI and HF are? Okay, so I'm going to get rid of them and I um, write explicitly that chi F of U is equal to the integral over all possible values of work of my forward probability distribution for work, e to the i u w. No, I'm not. And this is extremely, no, no, um, and this is actually, uh, say, basically giving up the, so, discovering who the mother is, okay, because uh, we are going to, we are going actually to, to um, I'm going to stress the fact that in principle, your process doesn't take you to equilibrium, and this has very, very strong implications at the, at the thermodynamic level, okay? So, no, um, by, by no means I'm at equilibrium. Okay, so I now put in my definition for probability distribution of work into this integral, and I'm using these two definitions there. So, um, I'm going to get a sum over n and m dash of um, an integral over the work w, of um, e to minus beta em, en over z naught, times this, um, this guy, you know, the square modulus of m dash u tau n square modulus. Then I have a delta of w minus em dash plus en. And then I have the final guy, which is e to i u w, which is set, no, is enforced by the fact that I want to do this Fourier transform. Okay, now I use the, no, the nice properties of Dirac deltas under integration. So uh, this gives me, this gives me the sum over n and then dash of um, e to minus beta, e n over z naught. Now I'm going to split the square modulus into one term and its complex conjugate, right? So I'm writing this guy as m dash u tau n times n u tau dagger m dash. And then here in this exponential, I have w, so I'm going to replace w with em dash minus cn. So e to the i u times em dash minus cn. Okay, 
Now a little bit, we are, we are, basically, we are basically done because what follows simply a rearrangement of, of things, a trivial rearrangement of things, okay? So I'm going to rewrite this expression. Everyone okay with that? I've just opened up the definition of the probability, the conditional probability, and uh, used the property of Dirac delta under integration. So now I'm doing a sum over m dash of, well, I can take this guy here, and I can take this guy up there, right? They are C numbers, so I can play with them as I want, right? So I have um, m dash u of tau n. Then I have e to mine. I have a sum. Um, sorry, the sum is over m and n. Okay, m dash and n. Then I have e to minus beta e n minus i u e n over z naught. Then I have an n, a u tau dagger, m dash, and then e to the i u e m dash. Did I forget any term? I think I didn't. It should be OK. Yeah? Now, guys. I can do another trick, right? So I can actually, and I'm doing it because I can. I'm doing it on the white, on the blackboard. It should this, say, should it, this be a, 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 a undergraduate lecture? People would have killed me. So I'm doing it right now. You forgive me for that. So what I'm doing is that I'm taking e to minus i u e n, which is a c number, and I'm plugging it here. Okay? I can do that. I mean, that is perfectly legitimate. So. I just move a little bit my time evolution operator u and rewrite here u to the uh, e to minus i u e n and delete it from there. And I remind myself, I remind myself that this, guy, this object here, right, this is an eigenstate of my initial Hamiltonian with an associated eigenvalue e n. Yeah? So I can reinterpret this object, just these two guys, as e to minus i u h i n. Make sense? Yeah? OK. So now I have, um, I want to continue in this direction. So now I have a sum over n and m dash of m dash u of tau, e to minus i, u, h, i, state n, e to minus beta, a, n, over z naught, state n. Then I have u of tau dagger, state m dash, and I'm doing now the very same thing I did here, this time on these two terms, OK? So I'm taking this object here, OK? So I have um, too much space, u tau dagger e to the i u e m dash. And I remind myself again that this guy was an eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian with this eigenvalue. So I can take these up, these two guys, and reinterpret them as e to the i, u, h final, m dash. Make sense? And I can do something else, no? Even, 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 more, even more unfriendly for you that are writing, right? So I can say, well, um, I have a double sum over n and m dash. This guy does not depend on n. This guy does not depend on n. The only guys that, this guy does not depend on n. The only guys that depend on n are these three terms. So let me move this summation inside. And I want to isolate these three guys together. Why? Because this is simply you know, the spectral decomposition of my initial state rho g of lambda naught 
uh, I want to follow the same notation that is there. Now this is my initial state, my initial thermal state, nothing fancier than that. So now um, I'm getting things that look a little less unfriendly, no? So I end up with a sum over m dash of eigenstate m dash, then I have u tau, then I have e to minus i u h i, then I have my rho g of lambda naught, u tau dagger, and e to the i u h f m dash. And this is a trace, nothing else, right? I'm taking the trace of this object, right? Makes sense? Which is a representation of my characteristic function for work distribution, okay? So um, I think this is a good point to stop. We go back to what we need, so what, what, which sort of use we make of this object tomorrow, and we extend the framework from closed system dynamics, so from unitary processes, all the way down to open system dynamics, characterizing in the very same way we did for work, the distribution for a new stochastic variable, which will become heat. And that will give us the chance to uh, illustrate a bit the interplay between um, open system dynamics and um, thermodynamics in light of Landauer principle. Okay, any question? Over lunch. Thank you so much. <laughs>